Okay, so today is a very big deal because this is actually the first time as a cast that we've all been together as an ensemble, the legacy actors, the new actors. So. I've never been called legacy anything, so I just like hearing it. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Do you have memorabilia from the first movie that you took with you? It wasn't really memorabilia. I liked the boots. Yeah. They were comfortable. I kept the boots and I found them the other day. No! I found the original oh, boots. I kicked the dinosaurs with those things. Yeah. <laughs> Look at the ring. Hey, Laura, will you Isn't that ring? beautiful? Oh, Alan Grant gave this to me. 25 years ago. 25 years ago. It was the last and only romantic thing Alan Grant ever did. And Laura Dern stole it from Jurassic Park, and so we were able to use it in this movie. From the beginning, we really wanted to make something that was new enough and fresh enough that it could give people a reason to come back to the theater and also give kids a reason to hopefully go back and watch the original films. Let's make them all! Yeah! I saw the original Jurassic Park in the theaters in 1993. I was just enraptured. I think I saw it twice opening weekend. It really defined my generation. <laughs> you did. You crazy son of a bitch, you did. Steven Spielberg had broken new ground, and suddenly that which had never seemed real before now was totally believable, totally real, and we were there. <laughs> The first trilogy had three characters who we loved, and then the sequels were about Owen and Claire, who hopefully we also care about. Trees, trees, go, go! And now in the case of Dominion, we wanted to integrate them and make the case that this was actually one long story from the very beginning. So wait, you were in Jurassic World. I was. Jurassic World? Not a fan. I'm sorry to take it personally. <laughs> We really look at Jurassic World Dominion as bringing together all of the elements that we have created, sort of finishing them all off. The most exciting thing for me is to see these two casts of these two iconic franchises come together into one. Five or six years ago when we started this, I certainly had no idea where we would end up. I desperately hoped Sam Neill, Laura Dern, Jeff Goldblum, that they would be happy with what we did. This isn't about us anymore. I was very excited by the idea, and I love Chris Pratt and Bryce Dallas Howard, and I had gotten to know Colin and loved his passion for the entire franchise. But I think it was really he and Steven and Frank Marshall all together being very protective about my character, Alan Grant, and Ian Malcolm, and really trying to get a sense of how to bring them back that got us particularly excited. Don't, don't move. Of course I was interested, but I wasn't particularly interested in coming in as a sort of cameo thing. That wouldn't be fair on me or, or Alan Grant. <laughs> Do you know the code? I didn't know there was gonna be a code. Here we have these three characters who we know from the events of Jurassic Park who have a special relationship with each other. And then the question becomes, what happened to those characters? And now, why they come back together? Humans go extinct. Dinosaurs never the earth. Colin had a lot of conversations with all of the actors about their characters. So what you see is really a deeply collaborative process. Good, 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 good. Yes. Yeah? Sure. I feel good. All right. Let's do it. We're Beautiful. Done. Thank We're done. you very much. We shot a big chunk of Owen and Claire's part of the film, and then we shot a huge part of Laura and Sam and Jeff's storyline. So the experience of making the movie really mirrored the experience of watching the movie, where you're just seeing these two trains on separate tracks that are drawing closer and closer, and you know they're going to collide. And then when they finally do, you've been waiting for it, and you've been anticipating it. and. You then you just get to live it. And action! They helped me escape. And cut! Very good. Colin sent a photo of us to Steven Spielberg, and he texted me back that it had brought a tear to his eyes to see us all back together. Look at you. And look at me. And look at you. Wow, this is so trippy. Wanting to bring back all of these original cast members, that's what makes this final movie so special. 
it's a celebration of the entire franchise. There is a big underground market for dinosaurs now. It all comes through here. Just try to blend in. In the future, when dinosaurs roam the entire world and their presence is ubiquitous as an iPhone, there are black markets that trade in everything dinosaur. So one of those black markets is in Malta. And this is legal? There's no such thing as legal here. I've never seen anything like it. I truly haven't. It's this massive underground marketplace, you know, crazy things happening. <laughs> it's just, it's just absolutely unbelievable. Malta to me was a big fantasy sci-fi idea, just to be able to go into this hive of scum and villainy. When we created Malta, we wanted to find a balance between representing the way that these animals are likely to be treated in the real world and also something that could feel vibrant and adventurous and fun. It's a little bit of everything. Anything that you want to find, anything you can imagine, that's the underground market. This place, not your vibe. Kevin Jenkins has made some of the most incredible sets that I've ever worked on in my life. They're truly remarkable. The important thing was to make it feel like it was down and underground because, you know, you're sort of basically telling your characters that you're going to a place you shouldn't go. Everything was then based around trying to have a set that allowed you to shoot it from every angle and to allow you to constantly move through and get lost within it so you don't actually understand the space. And so to get the up and down levels in the set, we decided to basically take the floor off and move in to have these natural steps coming in. As an actor, you want truth. If my eyes look over there, that's the truth. That's the truth. That's the truth. Everybody on the team has taken so much care and consideration to making this as truthful as possible in the world we've created. Welcome to the dinosaur market. I'll walk you around it, show all the different areas, but basically this is a very good vantage point. You can see the whole thing from here. If you come into the main area, you've got a handbag hutch over here, which is all dinosaur skin bags. We made all of those. This is the incubator area where you can buy hatching dinosaurs and dinosaur eggs. Supposed to look very homemade, but it's slightly reminiscent of the original Jurassic Park incubator. Through into the barbecue area where you can order locust and lamprey and other various kind of food. So this was all practical, flames roaring away, people sat here and ate. These chaps are still in here. Again, this is an example of you know, how we have to make a cage from scratch which works for the puppeteers. They're working from behind, sometimes underneath. But again, here, just as I mentioned, this box actually conceals several puppeteers who are working underneath. This is the biggest scene we're doing in Dominion uh, with practical dinosaurs. We have Microceratus, Lystrosaurus, a Baryonyx, we have Dimorphodons, we have giant locusts. <laughs> it's like the whole vocabulary of dinosaurs are here in one place. 22 puppeteers in total working at any given time. To prepare for the market scene, it's been a few months. It feels like a lifetime. But that's just because some puppets have seven puppeteers on it. If we have five puppeteers underneath a set, then that's a completely complicated process of working with construction and set deck and the mechs and the fabricators to make sure that everybody is speaking the same language and understanding the same rules so that we can achieve the same look. It's just really exciting to have so much practical effects being brought forward. It's like Christmas every day for us. <laughs> you know what they say, don't work with children, animals, or puppeteers. We've got amazing animatronics, and we've even got a cameo from a little dinosaur that I think is gonna steal the whole movie. It's called the Lystrosaurus. It's hilarious and incredibly brutal. Back it up! The stunt team is remarkable in this film. We started up on the raptors, flipping over the rail, crashing into boxes. Owen continues to pursue. Action. So we've just been rehearsing Owen versus Delcourt, which we're doing up in the 007 stage. And they have a nice fight. Nice fight, nice fight. Could be like one, two, rip out. Here he is, four. Okay. The training was intense. We worked really hard to make sure we would nail it. Yeah. Getting old, baby. <laughs> 
stunt team really showed us how to maneuver in a way that brought truths. And in acting, sometimes you don't have to act. You have to pinch yourself that you're standing next to dinosaurs which look real. And I never thought in my life I'd actually see a real dinosaur ready to kill me. have a sequence that was in an urban kind of environment. I really wanted to see dinosaurs against old stones, things that are ancient to us, but in contrast with creatures that are 65 billion years old. Thought it'd be a cool combination. Now that we're not on an island, we need to create something as magical, but also different. We have a massive sequence that we shot in Malta that incorporates dinosaurs in this environment. It's like a born identity film with Jurassic <laughs> in there as well. The brief for the Atrociraptors was sprinters, basically, always on. All their muscles were firing continuously. They were always in a hurry, and they wanted to get you. That level of energy and that level of reality of the way they move through the space is what makes this feel like a very gritty, grounded chase sequence. And in order to get that energy, we're shooting with lots of cameras at the same time. And as part of visual effects, we have to take data from all of those cameras, lenses are, what the heights of the cameras are, so that we can recreate a digital version of the scene. And within that, we can then place our dinosaurs. The challenges for us were trying to make sure that the dinosaurs felt like they were really in interacting with the space. Using every opportunity we could to have those dinosaurs playing with surfaces, kicking off walls, knocking things over, tumbling through dust. And the fun thing about that was we could put all sorts of gags in there that we hadn't even thought about. Smashing through loads of stuff in the street, shots where we expected to be looking in one place at a dinosaur, and we thought, oh, actually, we can put it up there on the stairs and then it can jump down. There's a great shot in the sequence where Owen rides his bike into a plaza and there's a Carnotaurus and an Allosaurus. We had to recreate the square that they're in, make digital copies of any props so that we can knock them about whenever a dinosaur interacts with them, then animate our dinosaur to really sit in with the action. That lent a level of believability, which is one of the reasons why I feel like the sequence is so successful. It has so much energy. Claire realizes that the supervillain is Soyona, and so she tracks and chases her and ultimately gets into a really intense fight. Colin and the stunt team organized it and shot it in such a way that it's almost like all in one take, and it's really exciting and full of energy. Some really great stunts. <laughs> Claire's just had a fight sequence with Siona, oh, it's being chased by a dinosaur. Ends up jumping out this window, Ow. down into here, and then runs along the rooftop. We'll have a little bit of wire work over on our roof over the other side, with Claire's character jumping from roof to roof. of that ensues one of the greatest chase sequences ever put on film. You should see me ride a motorcycle. I am very good uh, with the help of an amazing stuntman. <laughs> My role is to double Chris Pratt on the motorcycle chase. We are dipping through the streets, dodging people, cars, and reacting to the dinosaur. Riding around the city of Malta, it's quite challenging, so chosen a really all-around motorcycle, the Montessa, the Honda engine in it. It can rip up steps, it can do jumps, it can clearly escape dinosaurs, so it's a great bike to ride. The camera department have their hands full on this one. They're using film on the big covert camera bike and all the picture cars. We got a small film canister on there, so they understood the, the weight restricts me in riding, so I wouldn't say it's bothersome at all. It's not all about what I'm seeing. I gotta understand what the camera's seeing and what kind of story we're trying to tell. There's been a bunch of dynamic shots we've done so far. Our VFX friends will obviously get involved later and, and get the monsters to chase us, but it's been unbelievably cool.
cut. Right. Cut. Cut. <laughs> Terrifying. It's so scary for real. The best part of my job is that I get to decide which dinosaurs are going to be in each one of these movies. That's when I turn into a 12-year-old kid with all of my toys in the sandbox, and that is probably the coolest job imaginable. If you wanted more Dilophosaurus, you get it. I thought you were one of your big brothers. You're not so bad. One of the most iconic scenes in the original Jurassic is when Nedry gets venom spit into his eyes. <laughs> that scene is really, really iconic. The Dilophosaurus is one of the great dinosaur entrances of all time, with it being curious and seemingly friendly, and then it just gets really nasty. The Dilophosaurus is just classic filmmaking, classic delivery of an animatronic puppet. Steven Spielberg and Stan Winston just used that puppet perfectly. There was never a digital Dilophosaurus in Jurassic Park, and because that one had been animatronic only, I really wanted to hold up that tradition. We looked at all the making of books. It's really difficult to know what size it was. There wasn't any molds from the original film, so we just looked at what was created before and, and started with a sculpture and built this dinosaur. So this here, the, these dinosaurs are still to come together. So these are still the foam latex skins. And these need to be put on the mechanical skeleton and the fabricated uh, structure and, and then we put on the frill. So I've just been uh, attaching the frill and now I am gluing his face down. I think it is for the scale, I think it is one of the most ambitious and complicated dinosaurs on the build simply because we're, we're trying to squeeze so much into such a small dinosaur. We knew that we wanted to at least try a few steps Working with Derek Arnold, our amazing head of puppeteering, puppeteering captain, we actually created a dinosaur that can move around, it can lift its head up and down, it can pull its arms up independently, the frill can come out. But I'm gonna touch it, because they've gone to lunch. You can see here that it folds down. And that was actually one of the trickiest things, because Colin also asked us to try and achieve not just the popping out of the frill, but also the, the folding back, because in the original film, it only folded out. So what just happened? So this is the moment where Kayla, like the true hero she is, saves Claire from the fate of this iconic dinosaur. Go on, get! Yuck. So, I have no idea what this is. Going to no idea. Average, no idea. <laughs> uh, I hope it's chocolate. <laughs> this is our main spit substance, a material called methacellulose, which is a food thickening agent which they use in milkshakes at your uh, your local burger joint. <laughs> I noticed in the original film, he first spits and he comes and grabs his shirt and it all strings up. So there's a substance we use in the film industry a lot called ultra slime. And any time you see anything stringing in a film, it's this stuff. Well, it just looks like mucus. This is the way of delivering it. Camera, action. And he just ejects it using this pump. So this is what fires into his face. That was a good shot, I think. Oh, it's well, it's But if you air, I would air down here as opposed to up yeah, here. Okay, you yeah. know what I mean? Because it's good for him to get in his mouth because he's going to get paralyzed and blah, blah. Yeah, that's this. You want to take two? OK. Ready? And action. Brill. 10 puppeteers. So there's two elements of uh, remote control, and then the rest of the puppet with the frill, the arms, the breathing, the legs, the body up and down, the neck and the head. It's all old school, just cabling and pulling. When special effects or stunts get on set, everybody gets a little excited and something's going to happen. Got it all planned. So it really would be pop, pop. Instead of pop, pop. Considering the barbel salt can and then the Dodgson connection and that same dinosaur, it's just like, oh, right, that's awesome. Like those little details, those callbacks, I was extremely excited to see that creature. The way that Dodgson meets his end. What's your story? <gasps> ah! Ah! Which is very similar to the way Nedry does. and. Since those two started it all with that Barbasol can, I hope people are very satisfied. <laughs>
Amber Mines. I think the thing that makes people love dinosaur movies in general is that we know they were real. You know, they're not aliens, they're not monsters. They were real animals that existed on this planet. So when you see them on screen, you feel like you're watching something that's actually happening. The great thing about those early Jurassics was that we had these great creatures so that when you cut to something that's computer generated, you believe it because you've just been so close to a, to a real thing, a real three-dimensional thing that you believe implicitly the next image. And I was amazed actually to get back onto this set to realize that we, we were doing this in the old school way with fantastic creatures. This is my baby. He looks fierce in the movie, but he likes to scratch him. Just like that. Yes. Yes. Well, actually, now I'm a little scared. Forget it. I don't want to talk to you. The Dimetrodon is terrifying, so creepy. The way it moves is horrific. It's crocodile-like. It was really exciting to actually have an animatronic filming with us. Ready and turn. Hurry! It was one of the first scenes that we filmed, and it was really exciting to have this living, almost breathing creature to act with us. It is a specialized craft to see what John Nolan was capable of and to be able to give him the opportunity not just to make animatronics for a Jurassic movie, but to make more than had ever been made for a single movie, which just excited me. We've got a seven-foot-long Dimetrodon in-camera practical dinosaur that Colin can use. And the process for us started like it always does with the sculpture, working with Steve, the paleontologist. The way we created dinosaurs on this movie is different than in any of the other Jurassic films. The dinosaurs themselves started in the art department. So we had clay modelers working with Kevin Jenkins, our production designer. You can do this in the computer, but it's not quite the same thing. And we sculpted the head and part of the fin. And then, of course, it looked weird without front legs. So David Darby, our head of department sculptor, just said, oh, well, we can block the legs out so that Colin can see them. And then, of course, we got carried away and we sculpted more and more and more. And the only thing we haven't sculpted on that dinosaur is the tail. Everything that you see was made by hand first. It was a clay model that was then scanned into the computer, turned into a 3D model that then was 3D printed in order to build an animatronic. So we'd actually have a performer inside here with his arms coming out there and actually gripping onto, onto these arms. So you can see you can perform that. The head and the neck is controlled with this rig here that Charlie's doing. We have three puppeteers that are behind the camera, looking at a monitor, seeing what the camera sees. Now, one RC controls just the eyes. They have blink and eye movement. One RC will control just the nose, and then one RC will control the mouth and the tongue inside. When the Demetrodon needs to just roar, it has to be specifically timed so that when the chest raises, the head's lifting, the arms are engaging. So anatomically, it looks like everything is happening at once. It's a big production. First day with our Demetrodon animatronic on set, and you can see right here behind me. We also have Laura Dern and Sam Neill fighting a dinosaur, which is something I haven't seen for decades, and I'm so excited to see it again. So I'm going to do a series as this guy is fully chopped down, head moving around like a, a dog with a rope toy. This is sort of back to basics in the best possible sense. <laughs> Be able to work with the 3D thing rather than a, you know, to, it, you know, it's right here in your face. It makes life so much more vivid. Yeah. Nice. Work. I got it. Its movements are terrifying, and its mouth is going at you. And it was three inches from me, and it was the whole thing. There's no acting there. It's it's right there. It was extraordinary. <laughs> Do the COVID test. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
hold up. There's locusts in this movie now? <laughs> um, in our study of genetic power, we saw how manipulating the DNA of creatures like the locust could lead to massive, massive problems. They're multiplying like crazy, and they're not dying. This is going to be a global famine. Locusts connote this kind of prehistoric, uncomfortable, life-threatening kind of vibe. You're going to get really, really scared. The most scared that you've been, Enron. Yeah, big, big, big scare. We discover Ellie tracking locusts across the country. Thanks for coming. Did anyone want to see it if it wasn't a dinosaur? Yeah, well, they get all the attention. It's obviously rather enormous. And swarms of them are decimating crops from Iowa to Texas. The locust was a really tricky one for us. I mean, just the delivery of that character, there's so many of them. Also special effects, flying locusts falling from the sky that are on fire. That's oh, bananas. You've got CG swarms of locusts. And then, of course, we had our practical version, which was uh, fully animatronic locusts about 30 centimeters long. This is our hero locust. We've only built one of these for the film. This is a fully animatronic locust. The face moves with all the pincers. Normally, the, the locust would have four legs, two on each side, but we've removed them for this scene so that we can add them in for CG reference. There's three of us offset operating. Something of that scale, you can't fit all of the motors inside the creature, so we had to rely on a self-contained animatronic locust where all of the motors that control the face were actually inside the body. We had floppy legs which were all mounted to the floor and then had servos in the floor pushing the locust up and down and moving it around which then animated it and made it look like it was holding its own weight. Yeah, quite a disgusting little creature. <laughs> There's a small scale uh, new developed locust with a tracker, rubber locusts, burnt locusts, people were eating locusts. My appetite has changed <laughs> because <laughs> When we had to smash one of them, yeah. I did overhear a request for cream cheese and pesto. <laughs> and when I saw, oh my God, I can't. Oh, oh. There's a great sequence where Ellie and Claire happen upon a bunch of dead locusts. <sighs> Nobody set their feet back. Uh... As you can see down here, we've got all the uh, locusts on the floor, dummy ones, and uh, all the animatronic ones that we were operating remotely on radio control. Yeah, really good. Oh, look at them. Are you going to feel bad for these things? It's like so good. <laughs> the truth is, is that the locusts are like these zombie locusts, basically, and they're still alive. And the second that an alarm gets turned on, they all kind of like come back to life. And books. I really don't like a cockroach. And then a flying cockroach, it's just horrible. It was a big day for SFX because they're hitting the locust with shot sticks. Shut it down! As these visual effects put the locusts in, hitting the servers, we had to do the sparks and that around the actors so we don't compromise the safety. Shoot, shoot, shoot. I'm like, hey, take this. Come on, take this. <laughs> That's cool. And then if it became about this size, I guess is my worst nightmare. I said to Colin, more terrifying than a T-Rex, without question. And more. Oh! Oh, damn, that felt good. And cut. Right. Excellent. This is my friend Beta. She's kind of stealing the show. Uh, oh my god, look at that family. I've always loved the Raptors. I'm a fan of the Raptors. I like to think that Maisie and Beta are very similar. They're small, but feisty, and they can fend for themselves. You want to get out of here? Also, their story arc is quite similar. You Google Velociraptor, 
you see a Jurassic Park Velociraptor. The journey of working with an animatronic versus working with something that's not really there, it's so much more fun to work with the animatronic. You have a team of experts making these things look so amazing, moving, living, breathing. You have something against which to really react. One of the things that's always been really difficult with animatronics is actually making them walk. And Colin and I saw an opportunity with Beta, who is Blue's daughter, to actually create a full-scale animatronic complete dinosaur that could potentially walk around in the sets. So that's been a really great collaborative design process between John Nolan and Kevin Jenkins and ILM Visual Effects. This is our clone of Blue. She's got every small detail that we've taken from an Industrial Light and Magic file and we've 3D printed that form and then recast it to create this foam latex skin. And this puppet will play as a full animatronic puppet. And now, just the teeth exposed on the upper lip, just that snarl. Good. Colin's really thoughtful about how he shoots the animatronics. It's like working with an actor, any actor. You know, you make sure you get the right angle on it, the right light on it, so we've got some beautiful performances. <laughs> I think Colin wants to understand their personalities, and he uses that when he's designing his dinosaurs to dictate the shape of their body and the markings on their skin. I just have to basically take the paint job of blue and paint this small version of it to look exactly the same as blue does, which is both challenging and uh, it's so much fun to do it on a different scale. Big bushy tail and pull it. Let's do that. The scenes where Beta interacts with other props. So we're actually creating a practical version so that they can cut from their CG beta into our practical beta and then have it wriggling around. She's asleep. Looks good, right? We also have scenes with Owen where Owen carries Beta in a sling, so that interaction really requires a practical puppet as opposed to a CG one. Is that a dinosaur on your shoulder? Yeah. Why? It was a lot of fun to be able to do that. This thing is basically a very, very expensive puppet wearing another very, very expensive puppet. We have what we call a performance puppet. A much more lightweight version. It'll have eyes in, but you can see here it's, it's posable, so we can pose the arms. And it's going to be a lot lighter than the animatronic because it hasn't got a robot inside. So effectively, someone can take these handles and actually perform it on the day. Let me see a little more sweater on the eyes. Yeah, like that. We'd love to create as much in camera and the eye corners could move left and right, the eyelids can track up and down. Every time the eyes blink, they pull into the skull like this. Just makes them look even more organic. And baby look away. And when she snaps, look to her. Ready? Snap. That's oh, nice. It's amazing how the team has created Beta. It's so similar to a living animal, like down to the way it breathes. And it's so helpful to have something that's so realistic. We're after Beta. And of these three wonderful heroes, one Terrified. emerges. And it's clearly me. And it's clearly the new alpha. It's sort of a proud parent moment where Maisie is able to control Beta in a way that typically I had. Eyes on me. She's got the alpha confidence. I think as Alan Grant, in a way, has passed the torch on to Owen, here Owen is passing the torch on to Maisie. What is that? Oh, yeah. Come here. See? Not so bad. In every movie, there needs to be a new big bad dinosaur. And it was really important to me that we found a real dinosaur that actually existed. Giganotosaurus, largest known terrestrial carnivore. He put two apex predators in one valley. Pretty soon, there's only going to be one. There's this really amazing sequence at the end of the film with all of the main characters, and we are facing off with this giga. So now come up like three inches. Oh, that's great. Let's cut. Awesome. Good job. Big hand. Well done tonight. We're not well doing your it's an animatronic, which is crazy. We're gonna see the Giga for the first time. We're very excited. And action whenever you're ready. Oh. 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 
That's so good. <laughs> uh, round of applause for our animatronics. Yeah. We've just been shown the Giga, and I'm really excited to be working with it. I didn't know that there was actually going to be an animatronic of the Giga, and it's massive. It's actually really scary. <laughs> you okay, Annie? It looks so lifelike. Even the tongue moves. Guys, can you show the back of the throat? Give him a voice. Oh my god! It's amazing. It doesn't look robotic or anything. My first reaction of, of Giga is I'm blown away. Talk about craftsmanship. Whenever there's a world where you can actually look over at something and respond to, I really don't have to act much. It's so disturbing. I saw the creature shot. Those guys are wizards. I'd never worked with anything like that before in my life. This is today in three categories. Because this is such a massive sequence, it needs to be structured by the best way to approach this technically. Here we are in the outpost. What we're going to be doing today is it's stunts involving the Giga. Bryce is going to get tangled in these wires, pulled back in the story. Chris is going to grab her hand and get pulled back with her. Chris is going to stab the dinosaur. Claire is going to shock it in the eye. Perfect. That's today. That's today. Cut. <laughs> the combination of the animatronics and the computer generated effects gives a reality to the most extraordinarily unreal things. It's there and it's happening. I saw them working on that. It was something. It certainly was for me. Giga. It brings you no small amount of discomfort. Well, that got the heart rate up. We had to lock that design before we shot it. So, you know, a lot of times movies of this size, you're able to do things in post production. You don't really have to commit to the design until later, but we built an animatronic Giganotosaurus. So, we didn't have the benefit of figuring that out in post. The initial concepts were done by Kevin Jenkins, which was really a 2D illustration at that point. But then they would create these amazing scale clay sculpts, which Kevin then scanned and brought into the computer and did digital models of it. At that point, we would then hand those models to ILM, who took them and added extra detail and scales. We built physical skeletons to go inside those dinosaurs to make sure that they were anatomically correct. And we gave those models to John Nolan, who 3D printed them at one-to-one -one scale. I wanted our hero dinosaurs, especially our Giganotosaurians, who really live in their environment. It was very important to me that we didn't just have this abstract character as a dinosaur turn up looking the wrong colour in the wrong place or the wrong shape or the wrong size. This is the biggest front half of a dinosaur that's ever been built in Jurassic World. It's absolutely massive. We were looking at the size of it and the Giga is six metres high in real life and 15 metres long. We're talking the size of a double-decker bus. They would have all weighed in the ballpark of somewhere between five and eight tons and the size of a few elephants put together. Both T-Rex and Giganotosaurus had enormous heads, the size of a bathtub. We knew that we could create an animatronic face. We knew we could create the skin, but the neck and holding that skin and the head off the ground, that needed something a lot bigger than what creature effects normally do. Jason Linster saw the designs of the scale creature that we made, and he built a massive version which takes the weight of the head, which is about a ton. So it's just an amazing achievement. What we're looking at here is what we call the fiberglass core, which is basically a fiberglass skeleton. And on top of that, we've got the sculpted foam latex skin. So they're actually putting it in sections, gluing all the sections together. And that's how we get the final look of the puppet. This is actually hard material. This is supposed to be like bone. When the robot moves around, we need it to move inside each other and to move around with the softness of the skin underneath. Yes. Yeah, really good. Yeah. This is the Giga Eye. It's been designed with this CNC cut jig so that every time we pull an eye out, they're always exactly the same. Everything lines up perfectly. We've got another former under there that is a mold of what the animatronic would be that con controls the eyeballs. I think eyes wide open is, is how we yeah. do it. These are the Giga teeth. Each individual one is different, and as you can see, they're numbered here, and there's 64 teeth. So each one will have to be glued up through the foam latex into the core underneath. We are out here in the forest. It's about four in the morning, and behind me is the Giga Notosaurus, which is animatronic made by John Nolan and all of the brilliant craftspeople at his studios. It has about 15 different puppeteers that are working for all of its facial movements and its breathing and its mouth and its eyes, not to mention the body at all times. And it's absolutely meticulous and brilliant work. And I'm just so lucky to be a part of it. <laughs> Well, that was 
Bryce Bryce. Bryce. I want to thank my co-star, Bryce, and the Giganotosaurus. <laughs>
that moment, we had all of them together, realizing that something that was a real part of their lives might be coming to an end. 850 crew, 38 dinosaurs, three countries, two units, eight down stages, one pandemic. That's a picture of Huge round of applause as we wrap Izzy. As we wrap the wonder, as we wrap Chad, as we wrap Laura, as we wrap Sam, as we wrap Chris, as we wrap Bryce, and we wrap Colin. I am very proud to be a part of the British film community. There was a keep calm and carry on vibe that permeated the entire production. We got to the very end of it. There were so many levels of why that was emotional. You know, a lot of hugs and a lot of warmth and, and some tears. And it was extraordinarily emotional. And I'm just amazed I even got to be there. Get in the selfie, everyone. Yeah, that's <laughs> good. It's so good. <laughs>